Welcome to the EMEA Recruitment Podcast, brought to you in partnership with Operation Smile. We're on a mission to create 100 new smiles by raising awareness and vital funds for Operation Smile to help children and adults with cleft lip and palate around the world. Find out more at emearecruitment.com forward slash operation dash smile. In this episode, we're joined by Nina Grosser, Chief People Officer at Ideals in Switzerland. She discusses the human-centered approach that helps the company attract and retain top talent. So hello, everybody. Welcome to the next episode of the EMEA Recruitment Podcast in partnership with our good friends over at Operation Smile. As my colleague Rose has mentioned, we're delighted to welcome Nina onto the show today. So hopefully you can still hear me okay, Nina? Yes. Hello, Paul. Great to be here. Ah, it's uh, great to have you on, on the show. Really looking looking forward to it. We've got a good list of questions to, to go through with you. And maybe before we start, I mean, I know you've you've travelled a lot in your career, uh, Asia, North America and, and Europe. So where, where do we find you today, Nina? Oh, I'm in uh, Switzerland, uh, outside the uh, Zurich area in a, in a small village. It's uh, very beautiful and uh, overlooking some green hills. Nice, nice. A great, a great place to be. An awesome quality of life in in Switzerland for for ourselves, but also I think families as well. I know we were just talking a bit um, off off air that you have two uh, two children, one eighteen, one ten. So I guess they keep you pretty busy on your your weekends and, and activities in Switzerland as well. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. It's exciting uh, stage of their lives. It's great to be. Uh, together and doing some interesting things, exploring, keep exploring, keep learning with them. Ah, excellent. So, I mean, I'm sure that they are going to pop up again at some point during the the, the conversation as well. And uh, and maybe even in your answer to the first question, really. Yeah, I mean, we uh, when we we start the podcast, I just like to try and start off with a, a nice, easy, the gentle question to start the conversation going. And and as because the podcast is in partnership with Operation Smile, uh, we like to ask the guests what the last thing was that made made them smile. So maybe it's a good um, first question for you, Nina. Oh, wow. That's a really good question. Every morning I go on for a walk in the woods and on the way there, I always pass a, a local kindergarten is by the woods and uh, by the creek. Uh, I went out early enough when the kids uh, uh, still playing outside before the first class. So the kids looking at them playing and uh, sometimes they give me a curious uh, look and uh, smile, always put a bigger smile on my face. That's that's a great way to start my day. Mm, that sounds that sounds a perfect way to start the to start the day going for a walk in the woods in Switzerland. I mean, there's not so many people that can start their day <laughs> The, the day that way and i guess it just puts you in the right frame of mind really for the, for the day ahead and clears your your mind and gets you focused really on what you've got coming up right i can do so also because uh, i work for a company now remote first so that's uh that's one of the perks of uh, uh being able to work from home most of the time yeah i mean i know this is something also we're gonna you know talk about a bit in in the conversation because I, I know it's something you feel very passionate about you know helping to make companies future fit and being very human centered in your approach to hr and people projects and uh, uh and I, I, before we kind of go into that in a bit more detail i uh, it's, it's hard not to have a, a conversation like this with people in i mean we're recording this now in uh the end of september 2022 you know the, the world is going back to some kind of normality from a, at least from a covid point of view and uh, you know right. it's it's kind of hard not to ask a question related to covid because you know the, these things that you're doing now like the walk in the woods to start your day and uh, and and the uh, the approach that you have around being very human centered i mean uh, do, do you think these are things that have become more important because of covid people have kind of value these things more yes absolutely and this is taking taking care of our people and really care about their physical, mental health being is really important, uh, particularly in a hybrid, either in a hybrid or remote first uh, environment. You know, care is one of uh, ideals, uh, cultural core core values, and uh, we are our, our CEO and the senior leaders care about it greatly. 
and we have a uh, great practice uh, to put this put this in into into place such as delivering surprising surprise boxes gift boxes to people's home uh, it's a seasonal box with uh, sometimes with blankets or with summer uh, picnic kit and oftentimes there's a little gift for their children as well so it's really deliver joy to our people and make sure that even though we don't see each other in person very often but the care is felt uh, very often I like that that idea. I mean, we've spoken to a lot of people on the podcast about how they manage individuals and how they help to, to kind of keep the team motivated and, and, and strong over COVID when everyone was remote. And we had quite a range of different ideas as to how they did that. But it's the first time I've heard of this one where sort of surprising people with gift boxes uh, for, for them and their children and families. That's a nice gesture that goes a long way to keeping people happy and, and motivated uh, which 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 kind of almost leads me on to my next question really uh, about mm-hmm. yourself i mean it's still relatively early, early days for you in this role but i, I thought i'd ask you how it feels uh, to to be the the chief people officer at ideals at the moment yeah i've been to this role for almost a six months um it feels really exciting and uh, refreshing and uh, energizing. And it is exciting uh, because Ideals is still going through some hyper growth and uh, with a 30 to 40% year on year growth rate. And we're expanding to new markets, uh, both geographically as well as uh, from the industry perspective. Uh, as a SaaS company, uh, our main product is uh, service uh, and the products in the secure data room, which has been used uh, by more than 700,000 professionals um, from 120,000 uh, companies. So it's a, it's a product that is really stand out in the market for its usability and functionality. So this growth uh, attracted uh, new talent from around the world every week. We get to uh, welcome them uh, every week uh, in our new hands. And uh, it feels refreshing because even though our growth uh, has been very high over a period of time, we're still small enough uh, for me to get to know every team and every newcomer. And in our new hands, uh, all hands meeting, our CEO still personally welcome uh, every newcomer and uh, they have the opportunity to introduce themselves to the entire company. And uh, lastly, I think is energizing because uh, our HR is really on the journey uh, to create exceptional employee experience. Like you mentioned before, we want to use more of a human-centered design approach and methodology, as well as use new platforms uh, to deliver uh, this experience. It's definitely a journey, and I'm inspired by our people team, who are very de- dedicated and hardworking and really learn as fast uh, as they can to uh, t- to be on the full speed with this mission. That's exciting, as you mentioned there. You know, obviously, you know, things are going really well for, for the business mm-hmm. with a great product uh, out in the market. And uh, you, you've mentioned a lot about people and how you've got great people into the business and uh, using a human-centered uh, approach to people in the organization. And I think that our HR community would be quite interested to hear You know, are there any certain methods you've taken from a human centered approach or or certain ways that you've made the experience at Ideals really impressive, uh, you know, to help attract Mm -hmm. and retain people? I mean, you mentioned the surprise gift box that you give, but is there anything in addition that is more around retaining people and keeping people happy in the business? Yes, um, the human centered design approach, uh, we, uh, the people team, start to learn and adopt and apply really come from the actually the product design. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of IDEO, the kind of a guru, uh, a grandfather of a human centered design to tools. Uh, it's, a, it's a systematic approach that start with really understand the customer's needs, the end user's journey. So breaking it down and to understand the pain points, their wishes and the goals, and and then go through uh, a series of exercises to identify, to articulate what are the, uh, the problems or challenges uh, to be solved and look at adjacent you know, field as, as well as use uh, best of practices to bring cross-functional team to do brainstorming and to test the prototypes. I think these are the steps really make human-centered design differentiated 
than the traditional approach to come out with better products and design better experience. I feel like I'm fortunate uh, working at Ideals because Ideals is product and service company. And our customers who are the you know product managers and product designers, they understand this methodology. And so, well, for example, recently in HR, we need to redesign our onboarding experience because the onboarding program was primarily designed uh, back a few years back when we when we were still um, you know operate in in the office uh, setting. So this new approach in the during the redesign, we went out to um, survey and interview the recent new joiners uh, from different countries, really map out their journey by asking them different questions to understand what are their goals, what would they like to achieve, what are some pain points, what were they thinking about, how did they feel along different uh, timeframes uh, along the onboarding journey. And this gives us a really uh, important input to design from, from uh, big decisions such as, you know, when to open up certain information, tell them about the budget, uh, IT budget, so that they can uh, think about what to purchase for their home office, to small things like, um, you know, how to make uh, their first welcome email uh, easier to read and a to-do list easier for them to follow. So I think all these uh, uh, approach uh, and tools really help us to deliver uh, that experience. Well, it's really it's interesting because I mean you've talked there obviously about the, the the changing model where people obviously working from home a lot more and uh, and then also talking about the onboarding and keeping the, the trying to keep the the culture of the business uh, strong or, or continually improve the, the culture of, a, of the business as well which it sounds like you're managing to do at ideals which is great so uh, i mean is it tougher to do that now it's more remote because i you know i guess you know I, well i know that you're a big fan of uh, of course raising <laughs> coaches in 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 companies and 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 obviously you know, when people are working remotely, I would guess it's harder to build a culture when people aren't together day in, day out. So I just wondered how you embrace the constraints and the continuous learning within the organization and, and how to, to keep that culture going. That is a really good question, Paul. And uh, I think on the surface, it's, you know, culture resides in the artifacts. Uh, posters on the wall, the interactions, daily interactions, even the office environment, you know, the setting is a formal, is a less formal, what is promoted, uh, pool table, massage chairs, etc., uh, free lunch. And, but, you know, culture also has uh, multiple dimensions and ideals culture actually is one of the reason I joined ideals and I ha- I can't take all the credits, but I can surely share the story and what they've done right to uh, maintain that uh, very strong and unique culture. I think at first, um, ideals uh, core values are deeply rooted. I mean, these core values are not only endorsed and embraced by the CEO, co-founder, and still today as and as well as the senior managers, but also these core values such as care was uh, asked by the ideas um, to for the company to adopt through our previous people surveys. You know, there are beha- there are very clear behavior indicators for this care. It's not just a a, a label or a to to um, put on the wall. So, for example, for this care, the detailed behavior indicators are. We understand each other's feelings and emotions. We support each other's uh, prof- professional and personal growth. And, you know, with that in mind, uh, we have uh, practices such as delivering uh, gift boxes. We have practices to support uh, professional growth with a limited uh, learning development budget, uh, with, you know, book uh, reimbursement. And also we encourage um, idealers to join an uh, uh, inspirational network and conferences, there's budget for that and team building budget. So I think with these, um, these aspect of the culture is really identifying the right um, practices to embed them in the system, in the practices, in the culture. So it's no longer a one or person's voluntary act, but it is the whole system. You you don't have to think about it much, but just immerse in that system. I think um, another 
important aspect about cultivating a culture is measurement. And we have two ways to, to do this. One is um, we have our people survey uh, really ask people to, to tell us if the company is living the culture such as care, if the teams are living the culture such as care, and we share the results and debrief uh, about them. Um, but the second aspect actually is harder to do. Uh, many company wants to do it, uh, but uh, not quite there, which is to, um, in the recruiting process, I know you will be interested in this. Uh, we also evaluate the candidate's culture fit by looking for behaviors and using a uh, question to, to help understand uh, the, the candidate's uh, uh, behaviors, for example, uh, in care. So in that way, it does influence uh, selection and uh, selection decision. So in that way, we select the great people who can um, come together uh, around the shared value. So that's a, a great advantage. Hi, everybody. It's Paul Thomas here. I hope that you're well and you're enjoying the podcast so far. Thank you once again for your continued support listening to the podcast. I just wanted to break into the recording to talk to you about a really exciting partnership that EMEA Recruitment has along with Operation Smile. And as founder of EMEA Recruitment, it's an honor and a privilege to announce this partnership. Personally, I was born with a cleft lip and palate, so the mission of Operation Smile is something that I have a strong personal connection with. It's not an understatement to say that the dentists and surgeons that helped me were life changers. It's not only about the actual operations that take place, the support and care post and pre-operation are beyond value. And from personal experience, I can only say that I'd not be the confident, happy person I am today without this support. I want to help children experience the support and care and skill that I experienced on my journey and hope that we can do this along with Operation Smile. Every three minutes, a child is born with a cleft lip or cleft palate, and the mission of Operation Smile is to provide help and support to these children through providing 6,000 medical volunteers across 80 countries who are dedicated to help these children with facial conditions, most commonly cleft lip and cleft palate. More than 200,000 children are born with a cleft every year, and they are often unable to speak, eat, socialize, or even smile. However, it can take as little as 45 minutes and cost just 180 euro or 182 francs for Operation Smile to provide a child with life-changing surgery. Now in partnership with Operation Smile, EMEA Recruitment is raising valuable funds and aiming to create 100 new smiles to support the organization to provide free surgeries for children and young adults all over the world. Please help us by donating through the link in the bio or get in touch to see how your company can help get involved too. For the moment, I'll leave you to carry on listening to the rest of the podcast, but if there's anything I can do in terms of answering any questions or finding out how you can help and support EMEA Recruitments and Operation Smile, then please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you once again and enjoy the rest of the podcast. It's really interesting to hear because I know that there are a number of companies out there who invest a lot of time and, and money initially in putting their, their values together. And then after a period of time, you know, there, there's something that people might have on their on the walls in the office or their wallpaper on a, uh, a Teams or, or, or um, yeah, or Zoom call. But the reality is that uh, they, they're often kind of sometimes forgotten about by the large majority of people. But uh, I think it seems with, with ideals that the reason that it's, that the values are sticking within the business is because mm -hmm. it, it's, it's it's being measured first of all. I mean, I think uh, you, you know whenever you 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 measure something, you see, tend to see then it gets it gets managed in in the right way. But also, if you're hiring off the back of the, the values that are there, then um, then I think that that means you get a consistent personality type within the business that the the that buys into the the values as well which is uh, a great a great way of making sure that the values stay strong even though you're not in the office on a daily basis which uh, which um which is good, and because one of the things I was going to ask you about is, mm -hmm. yeah, probably not surprising, is the recruitment process aligned with this. I mean, I guess you, you know, you sort of hinted at the, the answer to that, but um, I mean, what 
you, you measure the values, obviously, and, and check that the, the, the person matches up to the values of, of the business. But are there any other areas where you feel uh, are really important to take when you're looking to hire new people? Anything that jumps out to you from experience where you, you, you feel they've been really important in the recruitment process for hiring efficient and effective um, quality people? Yes, absolutely. Especially in the growing phase, just having a effective and efficient recruiting process is something we uh, are, are continuously working on. And um, actually, Ideals has a quite a, um, a robust, rigorous, I have to say, rigorous and systematic uh, recruiting process. And we started with a very detailed job pro- profile and a clearly lay out the mission, objectives, and responsibility of this role. Uh, from a skill perspective, there's a clear definition on hard skills, competencies, uh, plus culture fit. So I, I'm having uh, I'm having several roles open right now, and uh, is really getting into the detail of this uh, process. It's um, multi-staged, including the screening and the competency-based interview. And uh, ideals particularly use test tasks. Uh, such as case studies and simulations uh, to test uh, the candidates. So these uh, multi-stage uh, can take, you know, a couple months to get uh, recruit for candidates. But, you know, it's uh, so important uh, to get the candidates right, especially when we're in the growing phase. No, I, oh, I agree. And- I mean, it's, it's much better to take your, your time on hiring somebody than to rush it and, and hire the wrong person because I think yeah, hiring the, the cost of hiring the wrong person is uh, yeah it's quite difficult to measure because of all the um, all the different angles of it but but the reality is it's very uh, yeah emotionally costing and then also yeah it does cost money as well to to keep if you hire and fire it and, and you can't get the right person in. And uh, the test tests sometimes take time and take effort. It can be a couple hours to several hours. So um, after uh, in some of the roles, after the test tests, uh, we give uh, the candidates a, a gift as a thank you. For example, we understand their interest and we can give them a training or conference ticket and based on their interest, it's quite, quite unique um, in this way. We also uh, develop a you know, good candidate experience. And our recruiters work very hard to improve our NPS in the in the candidates' experience. Well, that's great as well because it's it's always you, you want to be in a situation where everybody you interview leaves with a positive impression of your brand. So I mean, at the end of the day, you you can only hire well one person for one <laughs> role at a time, you know. But so for what every person you hire, there's a number of people that are being rejected for the position. And and, and people, you know, they don't mind being rejected as long as they're getting, you know, the the, the right feedback and they're they're being treated like a, a human being, you know. And again, you can see this this caring angle going through the interview process for yourselves. You know, if you're you're giving them something uh, back through the process and actually, yeah, they can see that you you genuinely care about them as an individual and then it's not um just a process for for you to get the person into the role yes indeed and uh, talking about feedback uh i myself just went through the recruiting process not too long ago at ideals and this is one of the few occasions when i received a very detailed feedback at the end and I really appreciate uh, that feedback. And normally, as part of the process, the recruiter will pass uh, through that feedback collected during the different interview stages, whether it's behavior-based competency interview or test test, to the onboarding phase. So the hiring manager will also receive this feedback to use that in, as an input to put together a development plan to help the new hire. So I thought that is a fine detail, but it takes effort and coordination to do, which uh, is definitely uh, very unique. Well, it's good because it shows you you get the, in this process here, you're, you've got the combination of the work by by humans and the combination of work by, you know, BI and data helping, you know, it's where mm-hmm. the, it's a great, um, 
combination of the two um the two approaches coming together to create a really exceptional process for hiring good people and leaving uh, a, a strong uh, impression um with with everyone that, that, that you meet and, and i think you know that obviously you know the question of bi and data comes up a lot regardless of the the discipline people are in regardless of the, the country people are working within as well but i i guess you're quite a strong advocates of BI and data and how it can assist HR in the future. Yes, absolutely. And uh, in order to create an exceptional employee experience, we need to continuously uh, listen to the idealist voice. So the one of the very first projects we're working on is to really uh, selecting a new employee experience platform uh, to take pulse service on key uh, moments throughout employee life cycle. For example, we mentioned about onboarding. We like to ask the new hires, how was their first day? Uh, basically, and, and how was the pre-boarding, uh, the virtual pre-boarding, um, their first week and the first month's interactions. Um, you know, after the 360 survey uh, assessment, we want to understand if they perceive uh, good value from this exercise. and. Uh, so in this way, we can collect um, uh, multiple data points and uh, they, we can correlate. And if we have data over time, we can see compare teams and also compare how uh, the correlation of these um, feedback to the to the level that uh, the teams achieve their business goals. So and the KPIs. So there's a great uh, amount of wealth of uh, data and uh, insights to tap into once we have that capability and understand how to collect uh, feedback and when to ask um, our idealers to give us their ideas and the thoughts. Yeah, and, and, and again, you know, it's good because you're, you're using the technology, but lining it up with you know, what is important for the business. You've got this set range of KPIs and measurements that are, I mean, they're important for the business, but actually I think, you know, individuals can see that it's important for them and their own progression as well. Uh, you know, we have feedback from a, a number of people, especially over COVID, that say their onboarding program was uh um yeah well they needed a lot of uh, help uh, let's, let's put it that way you know so i know a lot of people you know were not overly impressed by their onboarding uh, it, it over covid generally you know so to hear you know that you've got something very uh, very good in place that uh you know that, that uses the technology for the, the for the key uh metrics that are important for you and for the individuals is uh it is great. It's great to hear. I mean, I was just going to ask, you know, on the subject of you know, remote working and BI and data, I mean, I suppose one of the things, especially that the last three years has taught the majority of people is that, you know, it can be quite tough. You know, if, you, if you're working from home, mm -hmm. you, you're not really having that human interaction with, with people as much or at all anymore in your day job. You, you know, you obviously go through phases where, you miss that you know uh mm -hmm. you know so i mean how how do you work around that yourself or if anyone in in the business faces that how do you tend to, to overcome that uh, situation uh, that is another really good question and um, i think for idealers they even though they don't uh see their colleagues um as often as before they see their family more often for those who have uh, small kids, uh, you know, have uh, family around, they can live where uh, closer to their family. They can spend more time with their pets and all the time. So that 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 side of the human interactions actually enhanced uh, when uh, they uh, don't have to go to office very often. And uh, the other aspect uh, is that we actually have a um, budget uh, encourage people. Uh, to come out and get together. So, for example, for a uh, Friday pizza budget, you know, as long as uh, three people, they can ha go out, have a drink, and uh, and have some fun team building uh, on the annual, on a quarterly or monthly basis. Some budget for them to do do things together. So, our team members actually find other ways to come together in a more meaningful way. For example, they kind of participate in local uh, charity events together or uh, going, going for a marathon race together. Companies sponsor all these events 
uh, with appropriate budget so and, and the support. And I think for myself, um, I, I do go out uh, to meet uh, team members and colleagues, uh, you know, when when I feel like, wow, this it would be so great to meet in person. And also, um, I still keep up, you know, in my in my neighborhood, in my uh, uh, environment to meet with my former colleagues, um, people outside the company and who perhaps have a different perspective. And this also, you know, gives the window and the time and space to have interactions uh, to get more outside perspective in. No, I like it. So, I mean, I think you mentioned there, you know, the giving people the option to socialize the way they want to socialize rather than have it almost forced on them as a diary invites to say, well, oh, this lunchtime we're getting together, we're going to have a, a virtual lunch. Uh, you know, there's only, so there's only so much fun you can have at a virtual lunch, you know, whereas actually having a, uh, a Friday pizza budget allows them the option to go out with, uh, you know, a, gr- a group of people that they want to go out with knowing that actually, you know, it's good for the company and it's good for them as well. I, I, I like that idea. I can see <laughs> that doing very well at EMEA recruitment as well, to be honest. Me. so we might steal that idea from you but i like that one that's that's good so it's uh you know the the in terms of the um the interest in all of this nina i mean it's quite unusual to meet somebody who has a a, a passion for the culture and, and the future fits uh such such as yourself and i know we mentioned right at the start of the conversation that you you've lived in three continents and uh and, and had you know some really interesting experiences over that time uh, do, do you think that time you've spent you know living in different parts of the world uh, has has forged this interesting culture and uh and, and people or, or or was it there before then it's definitely, uh, definitely, uh, how to say, the living in uh, three continents, and tw- spent 20, 24 years uh, working uh, experience in three continents. That definitely uh, uh, give me a lot of the exposure of different culture. And uh, whenever I enter a new country, I almost have to spend quite some time to adapt and adopt the local behavior. So comparing culture differences almost becomes my... Um, uh, hobby. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if I think about, um, the experiences in different continents, there's a, there's a lot to learn. Sometimes it's not always easy, but it's, it's surely rewarding. Um, for example, I grew up in China and I've gone through a very highly selective, uh, school system. Um, there I learned to be very disciplined and stay focused and perform under stress. Um, but I would say I wouldn't want my children to go through the same experience. Um, but it's definitely, uh, uh, you know, build, build characters. And uh, in, in China, back in the 80s and 90s, where the doors start to open, uh, open to foreign exchange, there, there I see the opportunity. And I, you know, kind of build a desire to go to the U.S. because I really want to see another world and just uh, have fun and then test myself as well. So I, I have the opportunity to went to US uh, and uh, went to a graduate school there. I still remember, you know, I was admitted uh, to St. Cloud State University in Minnesota. And Minnesota is the second coldest state uh, in, in the US, you know, just a little higher than Alaska. I still remember I, I might, I have to pack a, a coat and it's so thick that it took a quarter of my suitcase. And, <laughs> and when I first arrived in the school in the orientation, one of the first thing they give all the international students is uh, the danger, how to cope with uh, the cold weather. And I, I remember there are always a few students uh, just left uh, right away during the uh, orientation because they had no idea how cold uh, Minnesota is. Um, but I think despite the weather, I, I found that the people in Minnesota is very nice, uh, very welcoming. And I finished my education there and met my husband and the start a family and uh, all all that exciting kind of a uh, life stage uh, events. And uh, I remember early on talking about culture differences. Uh, I had to learn English and learn a lot of the local expressions um, by watching TV, TV shows. And there was a show called The Third Rock from the Sun. 
And it's about uh, the extraterrestrials, uh, aliens, basically, who are on an expedition to Earth and the third planet from the sun. So they can stay kind of under disguise to be a family and observing all these interesting behaviors of the human on Earth and uh, discuss it um, uh, behind the scene. So I found all their uh, uh, the conversation about uh, human behaviors uh, in the local culture very relatable. So, and I think in the U.S., I just have, uh, I lived there for 13 years and I learned so much, not from, from a cultural perspective, but also from the business perspectives as well. I, Minnesota, despite this cold weather, is the headquarter of some very large uh, companies. Uh, for example, Cargill, uh, where I worked for several years, is the largest private company uh, in the U.S. They had 160,000 employees back then. And uh, I think the revenue was around uh, 10 billion. So it, it's I, it, there's a room called a Little Museum Room of the Founder, who is who was an immigrant uh, from Europe and went to the U.S. and started off a grain uh, storage along the Mississippi River towards the end of the U.S. Civil War. So from one grain storage to a multi-billion dollar uh, international business operating uh, in more than 60 countries uh, through several generations. It's, it's it really shows that, you know, U.S. at that time is just a land of opportunities, the entrepreneurship. So that's a, that's a huge eye opener. You know, after 13 years, why, why I came to Europe is because I have a fantasy, actually, for Europe. I love the culture. Uh, you know, it's diverse culture and architecture. So I, I came to, I was recruited by Vestas um, to lead uh, leadership development. At that time, I uh, did not even know which country I would go to. Would I go to uh, Denmark or go to Switzerland? In, in my mind, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and uh, after I've been here for a while, I I learned that there's a huge difference, and I'm glad I landed in Switzerland, have lived here for more than uh, 11 years now, that I learned and adopt a lot of the local Swiss uh, culture and habits as well. You know, here people are really care about the quality, uh, the environment, the quality of the product, the quality of the living. And, uh, you know, it's it's amazing small country that uh, is constantly on the most innovative uh, country around the world list. Well, at the same time, it is able to keep a, its, uh, its proud tradition, uh, you know, still come alive. So I, I think I continuously uh, discover Switzerland uh, still. No, well, that's it. I mean, I think it's it's a great story. You know, I think, uh, you know, as you mentioned there, the, the, the experience you've had in in the US, in, in China and in, in, in Europe and, and, and actually what you've um, what you've taken from these experiences and, and the reason why you, you made the moves around. Uh, I mean, I guess, you know, with your children, you know, one being 18, you know, so soon might be starting to think about travel in the future. It's, it's out, you sound very passionate and motivated about travel so i suppose uh, if it's in your bloodline you're, you're you know so you'll be kind of encouraging your kids to do something similar <laughs> yes indeed uh, my daughter is taking a gap year um she because growing up in switzerland she learned uh, german uh, french and uh, spanish uh, in, in wow. a language and she can speak chinese uh, a little bit of korean um so she she wants to travel to asia and also uh, can go to South America as well. So I think once the COVID uh, restrictions are fully lifted in Asia, she would love to go. And I would encourage her to to uh, to explore. Um, and she is, uh, um, you know, it's already quite well uh, averse on, on different culture because when she came to Switzerland from the U.S. at the age of seven, she had to... Uh, adept we put her into a local school and uh, she just had to figure out you know the, all the homework and the lessons in german so i have uh, a lot of uh, great memories for her early early stages uh, coming to switzerland i think so do you, do you feel do you class switzerland as 
as home now? I mean, do, do you imagine you'll be staying in Switzerland for for the long term, or, or do you think uh, there's another part of Europe in the future you'd like to explore? Oh, that's a really good question. In Switzerland, it feels so comfortable now, but I, I always have the urge to explore a new place. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and th- this is another advantage, uh, you know, with the with the remote working. I mean, the real- reality is you can be almost anywhere these days, and as long as you can prepare to log in uh, at roughly the same time, then, uh, you, you know, it doesn't matter where you are from a location point of view, which uh, I know it is very good on the remote, another advantage of the remote working sites uh, also. So, uh, yeah, no, no, I think obviously we, we've spoken a lot of uh, about ideals and the, and the great um the great work that you, you you're doing the great work the business is doing and i uh, just wondered uh, the last question really i mean if you felt there was one thing that ideals could add to their business would that would really um yeah be a, another step in the right direction is there anything you feel that, that they could they could add to make it even more exciting from a business perspective i think um another great product would really to make uh, help the business continue to grow and to better serve our customers. Um, and we're working on that already. And uh, from a from a people perspective, um, ideals is remote first. So we each of us has a home office. A lot of day to day interactions are happening in the digital space. So my wish for the the one thing for the people is that they no matter where they are. Um, they would have a, you know, be really close to nature and to have a big window to, you know, to, to feel them, help them feel connected and, uh, to, to, uh, the beautiful scene outside to make their work environment a joy. I think that's important. Um, because we looking at the screens all the time, but if you have a big window and the nature close by occasionally, you know, you can work outside or uh, feel that nature that help us to feel very balanced and grounded. No, I, I hundred uh, hundred percent agree with that. Uh, and uh, just as you were saying that, so I'm actually I'm working from home myself today, and uh, yeah, obviously we're looking at the screen now. But then to my left, we've got a big window in the office here, and you look out and you see a lot of fields and trees, and uh, yeah, I can actually see some cows in the distance as well. And it's uh, you know, it's uh, I think you, you you kind of need need to have that uh, if you're uh, at home for long periods of time. I mean, it can be tough, obviously, if you're you know if you don't have that luxury and you're in in a smaller apartments and uh, you know but but by the sounds of it ideals are doing everything they can even if people are uh, in in a smaller apartment that they try to to make things uh, uh, as as easy as they can for people to to be motivated and, and get the most from their experience of the remote working which which is great i mean it's been really interesting to hear you know how the business has done this so i think you there'd be a lot of uh, companies very envious of what you've achieved, and I think a lot of um, a lot of people very envious of uh, the fact that they're not working for you. So you might find, uh, yeah, some people try to apply to Ideals now after this uh, after this podcast. But uh, it was great <laughs> great to get this information uh, from you today, Nina. Really appreciate it. And uh, and then the last question, really, if anyone wants to connect with you, what's the easiest way they can reach out? The easiest easiest way would be LinkedIn. Um... So write me a note and also, you know, talking about uh, career and the growth opportunities, we have uh, uh, many j- job openings on our career website. And for those who are interested, and please check out our career website as well. Our recruiters' names are often listed, so you're never uh, it's never too hard to figure out whom to contact uh, to express your career interest or network interest at Ideals. Perfect. That's great. No, I'll, what we'll do as well when we uh, put the podcast out there, we'll make sure we put a link to your uh, your profile so it makes it easy for people to connect with you as well. But uh, yeah, huge thanks for your time today, Nina. Really appreciate it. It's been really interesting, and uh, obviously we'll, we'll keep in touch. And uh, yeah, in the meantime, uh, wish you uh, you and your family all the best. And uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, yeah, this the next twelve months are as successful as the last uh, six months at Ideals. Thank you so much, Paul. It's it's great to be here to have this conversation with you, and uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity. No problem. Have a good day. Speak to you again soon. You too. Bye, Paul. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode. If you'd like to reach out to Paul or myself, please feel free to send a connection through on LinkedIn. 
And if you'd like to listen to previous episodes of the podcast, you can find them all at our website, www.emearecruitment.eu.